If you, go, you were going to read an account of the crucifixion of our Lord, from what book of the Bible would you read it? Well, immediately we would think that we would go to one of the Gospels. We would go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and there we would find the details of the crucifixion of the Lord. And indeed, you could. There would be a piece here. There would be a part there. But there is nowhere in all of the Word of God that gives us such a, an in-depth, exhaustive, an eloquent description of the crucifixion of Christ quite like Isaiah 53. So I want to invite your attention this morning to the gospel according to Isaiah. And we'll start in Isaiah 52. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Isaiah 52 and verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there, shall be, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he hath put him to grief. Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Father, how do we come? How do we come today to such a stupendous text, so full, descriptive, eloquent, horrifying? Help us now, Lord. We depend upon your Spirit, and Father, we pray for those here today who've yet to receive the Lord Jesus. God, the heart, our heart's desire and prayer to you is that they might be saved, even in this service today. Thank you for Jesus. Help us now to bow at the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In the book of Isaiah, this is what is called one of the servant psalms. There are several throughout the book. And This is a servant song that is ironic to me because here's the sovereign son of God. He is over all things. He lacks nothing and yet is referred to in Isaiah as a servant. That what does this say about us? When we reluctantly serve the Lord, when we don't want to get involved in serving the Lord, and yet here's the Lord Jesus who is sovereign, who is God of very God, and he condescended to be a servant. And this is a servant song. 
These words were written 700 years before the incarnation of our Lord. 700 years before Jesus would ever come into the world. And yet Isaiah writes with pinpoint accuracy everything that's going to happen at the cross. He tells us what God did. He tells us what men did. He tells us what Jesus did at the cross. And he does it 700 years before it ever happens. What a, what a passage of scripture that there are five stroves in this song. And I want to call four things to your attention this morning about the Lord Jesus. The first thing I want to say to you is that our Savior, our servant, is an astonishing servant. He is an astonishing servant. Servant. Notice what the Bible says, for example, in verse number 13, he will act wisely. My servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted. Now, I've already said this is a psalm about the crucifixion. This is a song, rather, about the crucifixion, and yet it doesn't start out with the crucifixion. First of all, he says that he will deal prudently, that is, he will be successful, and, and then he says he will be highly exalted. But this is about the crucifixion. It's as if Isaiah comes to us and he says, now look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what Jesus did on the cross. I'm going to tell you about his sorrow, how he was pierced. I'm going to tell you about the agony of the cross. But now, before I do, I want you to get this big and plain. That's not how the story ends. It is, it is not in with the crucifixion. It is not in with the death of the Son of God because Jesus Christ is going to be, first of all, successful you don't see that do you you don't see that. I mean, here he is going through the streets of Jerusalem, carrying his own cross. His back is bleeding. His head is crowned with thorns. He doesn't look successful to me. There he is. They're nailing him to a cross. He doesn't look successful to me. There he is, high and lifted up on a cross. He doesn't look successful to me. He may not to me, and he may not to you and to the rest of the world, but to the God. Out of heaven he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Isaiah said, now I'm going to tell you about the death of Jesus. I'm going to tell you about his sorrow and about his agony. But before I do, let me tell you this. He's going to be exalted. He's going to be highly exalted. Oh, he's going to die. He's going to be shamefully treated. He's going to suffer the contradiction of sinners but that's not how it ends. Jesus does not end rotting and decaying on a cross. And Jesus does not end rotting in a Judean tomb. Jesus Christ is going to be highly exalted. It is impossible that he could be holden of the grave. And he's going to be exalted. I think this was a process. The exaltation of our Lord was a process. It started there in the tomb when the breath of God swept through that slumbering clay and the dead lifeless body of Jesus came back to life. He started the process of exaltation. I think it continued on the Mount of, the, of, uh, Mount of Olives when he defied the laws of gravity and the Son of God ascended Back to the Father. That is part of the process of being exalted. Started in the grave, continued on the Mount of Olives, and consummated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Isaiah said, now let me tell you about Jesus. This is how the story's going to end. But there's a lot of details that take place prior to the exaltation. Don't you love him? Tell me you don't love the Lord this morning. Look what he says. He shall act wisely. You see, he's telling us Jesus is going to be exalted. He's going to be lifted up. But look at verse 14 where we were astonished at him. His visage was so marred. Isaiah sitting at the foot of the cross. Isaiah has his pen in hand. Tell us, Isaiah, what is it that you see? Tell us what's happening at the cross. And 700 years before it ever happened, Isaiah said, this is what I see. We were astonished 
at what we saw. We see the blood, the sweat, and the tears of the Son of God. We see the agony of the Son of God. And we were astonished. He was beaten. He was brutalized. He was beyond recognition. We were astonished at what we saw. Beaten, disfigured before our very eyes. Then in verse 15 he says, but good came out of that. The sufferings of the cross, the blood of the cross. He says, it is with that blood that he shall sprinkle many nations. There's some debate over the exact meaning of this word sprinkle, but let me give you my take on it. Given the context and the range of meanings associated with the word, it is a ritualistic word. It was a word with whom, with which all of Isaiah's Uh, listeners would have been quite familiar. Sprinkle. This is the word that was used on the Day of Atonement when the high priest would gather the blood in a basin and he would sprinkle the blood on the Holy of Holies, that box overlaid with gold, and it is sprinkled on the altar. And he says, this one who was beat beyond recognition, this one who suffered as no man has ever suffered, I'm going to tell you some good came out of it. And the good that came out of it is the blood of Jesus Christ sprinkled on the Holy of Holies, satisfying the righteous demands of an outraged God. Astonished. He's an astonished Savior. But there's a second thing, and that is he's an amazing Savior. Astonished. We looked at him dying on the cross. We were astonished. We were aghast. We were overwhelmed. How? How could any man be so beaten? How could a man be beaten to the point that he no longer looks like a man? His beard has been plucked from his face. His rib cage is now exposed. And we saw that and we were astonished at what we saw. But then Isaiah says, he's amazing. He's amazing. He begins verse 1 and says, Who hath believed our report? Who has believed our report? That is quoted, it is quoted verbatim in John chapter 12. And in the context of John 12, Jesus had been performing miracles. Think about it. Little boys and girls had been raised back to life. Men and women had been healed. Their blind eyes had been opened. Their deaf ears had been unstopped. Their lame legs now have power and strength in them. And people have benefited from the power of Christ, from His compassion. And yet, in that context of miracles, Jesus asked the question, Who hath believed our report? Who? They've seen the power of Christ. They've seen the love of God embodied in Christ. They've seen that he has power over disease and death and sin. And yet, our Lord asked the question, Who hath believed our report? I want to ask what Isaiah asked, what our Lord asked. Let me ask this morning, Who hath believed our report? Why would you not believe the gospel? Why would you not believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord? Why would you not believe to the saving of your soul? Why would you not receive eternal life? Notice what he says. He says in verse number 2, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. A, A tender plant, just a scruffy little plant. Notice how he describes Jesus. A tender plant, just a scruffy plant out of dry ground. He's describing the Lord And I speak respectfully and reverently when I say this, but there was nothing outstanding about the appearance of the Lord Jesus. I think sometimes we get the idea that Jesus, because He was the Son of God, when He was on earth, He would have had a heavenly glow about His body. He didn't. He would have had a halo around His head. He didn't. There was nothing physical that would have identified Jesus as the Son of God. He was just a tender plant, just a scruffy plant. Jesus would have looked like any other Jewish boy of His day. You would have never seen Him in a crowd of His peers and said, I bet that's Him. Look at Him. I bet that is Him. Look at His eyes. You can see it. Look at it. Hear the tone of his voice. You can hear it in the tone of his voice. You can identify Jesus. No, no. He was just a tender plant. 
just a scruffy little plant. That's all he was. But then he gives us more information and says, out of dry ground. The dry ground represents the nation of Israel. And he says, this scruffy plant came out of this dry ground. Isn't it somewhat ironic that when God had his only begotten son born of a virgin, he didn't do it. He didn't, he didn't have him reared in a palatial palace somewhere. He didn't send him off to an Ivy League school somewhere. But he came out of all places. He came out of Nazareth. Nazareth was a, was a little village, just a hamlet. Maybe, maybe a couple thousand population is it. And he was there in the north part of the region of the Galilee. It was a hick town. It was a hillbilly town. And the people of Nazareth were not regarded as powerful, influential, important people. And out of that dry ground came this scruffy little plant, the Lord Jesus. Isn't that just like something God would do? Is that it like, didn't God do that in the birth of His Son? He, he wasn't born in Jerusalem, the capital of religion and politics. But in a little hamlet outside, a few miles, known as Bethlehem there. And here the Son of God is not born in Jerusalem. He does not live out His life in Jerusalem. He does not sit at the feet of the renowned rabbis of His day. But instead, as a scruffy plant out of parched ground, comes the Son of God. Well... He continues and says in verse number 2, There was no form nor comeliness that we should desire Him. Nothing spectacularly handsome about the Lord Jesus. No splendor about His person. Nothing that would cause people to be drawn to Him and say, Oh my, that's got to be the Messiah. But look at verse 3. He's despised and rejected of men. Despised, rejected. Why? Why would anybody despise the Lord of glory? Why would anybody reject the Son of God as He offers the whole world the free gift of salvation, forgiveness of sins, a home in heaven, fellowship with the Father? Why? Why in the world would anybody despise the Son of God? He was despised. Such a contemptible word. Despised. Such a terrible word. Despised and rejected of men why all he did according to the bible is that he went about doing good he pre he, he performed miracles he taught divine truths that when believed and acted on would transform a life and yet in spite of all our lord did with his actions and with his words the result is that he was despised and rejected of men some of the saddest words in all of holy scripture is that he came unto his own and his own Received him not. The Lord Jesus came to his own creation. That which he had made. And his own people rejected him. He was despised. Despised. And rejected. Amen. Kind deed. Kind word. And yet he was despised. And rejected of men. Uh, acts of compassion. Words of tenderness. And yet he was despised. And rejected of men. But he gives a further description of him. Uh, he says that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Sorrows. This word sorrows literally means heart pains. And I know you've had some. You've had some heart pains in your lifetime, young or old. We, we don't get very far in life until we start having some heart pains. That's what this word sorrows mean. And I want to speak respectfully to you this morning. The dear one, you've never had heart pains like the Lord Jesus has had. You've not known sorrow like the Son of God has known. I would suggest to you that it is impossible. You are incapable of suffering sorrow like our Lord did. And the reason is because He is entirely, completely holy and righteous, living in a world that has the stench of sin upon it. And uh, He suffered sorrow. You see, you see it played out in the life of the Lord when one day he walks the winding streets of the city of Jerusalem until he has come to an apex and he looks down on the city of Jerusalem and he says with a broken heart, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you unto myself as a hen doth gather her chicks, but you would not. Amen. 
Jesus had heart sorrows. His own brothers and sisters said, he is mad, he's crazy, and they rejected him. His own disciples would walk with him for three and a half years, hear him teach, watch him wire the wrinkles out of a raging sea, and yet the day would come when they would abandon him and act like they didn't know him. In fact, notice the latter part of this verse. It says, and we hid our faces from him. He's despised and rejected. He's a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. And now he says, we hid our faces from him. The picture is this. You put something over your face. You cover your face so you don't have to see him. The picture is he's walking down the street and he's walking toward you. And so you duck into a, a shop so you don't have to deal with Jesus. The picture is you see him at a distance, but you run and hide. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. We don't want to deal with him. We, we don't want to have to make a decision. We don't want to have to hear his voice. We don't have to see his eyes. We, we don't want to deal with Jesus. And so we hid our faces. I'm going to tell you, you can duck into a shop. You can cover your face with a, with a quilt. But sooner or later, you've got to deal with Jesus. You cannot hide your face forever. He is the inescapable Christ. Sooner or later, every man and woman, boy and girl, is going to deal with Jesus. Amen. We hid. We hid our faces. We don't want to deal with him. We don't want to have to make a decision. We don't want to have to say yes to him. We don't want to have to say no to him. And so we hid our faces from him, but I got to go quickly now. Time is getting away. He is an atoning servant. Oh, I wish I had the vocabulary and the mental sagacity to discuss these verses with you today. Look what he says in verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. The thing that stands out to me is that this is all in the past tense. Isaiah's writing in the past tense and he says, He has, it is a done fact, it is accomplished, it is done, it was done in the past. He hath, he hath borne our sorrows, past tense. And yet Isaiah's writing 700 years before Jesus would ever be in Mary's womb. 700 years and yet he says, He hath borne our griefs. Well, how do you explain that? How do you explain that he says it has already happened and yet we know it is 700 years, 730 years in the future before Jesus would ever go to the cross? I'm telling you this. Here's the answer. This is the explanation. When God says something is going to happen, you can all go ahead and refer to it in the past tense because it's going to happen. The Bible says that Jesus stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There wasn't enough, there's not enough power in the devil, not enough imps in hell to keep it from happening. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When Isaiah said he had borne our griefs, he's saying it's as good as done. It is a done deal. It's going to happen. Nobody can prevent it. Nothing can stop it. He hath borne our griefs. Look at verse 5. He has wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of Saul. I've got to say, say this to you. I've said it many times. One of my all-time favorite preachers was a former pastor of this church, Dr. L. Chester Gwynn. I was just a young preacher boy. And back then, churches had revivals. And back then, when they had a revival meeting, they met at 10 o'clock in the morning and 7 o'clock at night. And what a time we had. And Dr. Gwynn was preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Palmyra. And I'd go every night I could go to hear him. And I could go during the mornings he was preaching through the book of Ruth. Boy, that was good. And at night, I heard him preach one night from Isaiah 53. And he read his text and he said, I don't think we're doing any harm to the text to read it this way. 
Read it with me in verse 5. But he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes I am healed. I have gone astray like sheep. I have turned to my own way. And the Lord has laid uh, his iniquity on him for me. You may leave here today unimpressed by the singing and the preaching and anything else. And that's fine. That's your choice. But don't you leave here today without knowing that the cross of Jesus Christ was about you. It's what it's about. It's not about man being maladjusted. It's not about man's psychological needs. It's not because man is physically sick. The cross of Calvary is all about man's sin. Our sin put him there. Our sin nailed Jesus to the cross. Notice what he says. Notice what he says in verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. That word transgressions means that we step over a line. And I've stepped over the line. You've stepped over the line. The best person you've ever known has stepped over the line. Listen to me this morning. We have all stepped over the line. The line has been drawn by God. It is the holiness of God. It is the righteous standard of God. And there came a day when I stepped over the line. You did too. And the whole world has stepped over the line. It is our transgressions that makes the cross necessary. Our transgressions nailed Jesus to the cross. Our iniquities iniquities means to twist. It is, it, it is the idea of to pervert. And I'll tell you, we've all perverted the things of God. And yet, in spite of ourselves, in spite of our stepping over the line, in spite of our iniquitous behavior, the Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. What he's talking to us about here is the substitutionary atonement of our Lord. That is, Jesus Christ took our place. You do understand this morning, don't you, that you deserve the cross You deserve the wrath of God. You deserve the outrage of God. It should have all been poured out without mercy and without end upon our heads. But in that day, Jesus Christ took our place, bore our cross, endured our our curse in order that we might be saved. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. What I'm telling you this morning, dear one, it is all about Jesus taking the full brunt of your sin. I don't know how it happened. I can't imagine it's inconceivable, incommunicable. I don't know how it happened. But somehow or the other, God took all my sins and he took all of your sins and he took the sins of the whole world and somehow put them in some kind of baggage and placed all of that baggage upon the head of the Son of God. And there he is seeing his Son who was without sin, without spot, without blame, sinless. And God sees him now not as sinless, but as one who is bearing the sin of the world and and pours out all of his wrath, pours out all of his judgment on his Son. It should have been me. It should have been you. You should have been there. You should have died. You should have suffered. You should have been condemned. But instead, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Hallelujah. What a Savior who took our place at Calvary. Look at verse 8. He says now, Uh, in in verse 6 that all we like sheep have gone astray by the way look at verse 6 would you let me just show you this quickly take out your marker mark this all we look at the last part of it us all all we like sheep have gone astray and yet the Lord has laid on us the iniquity of us all it starts with all of us at the beginning it ends with all of us there at the very end I want to ask you to do something this morning I want you to walk in to this verse, to the first, all. All we like sheep have gone astray. And now by faith, what I'm asking you to do is to walk out of that verse under the same all. All have gone astray. All have had their sins paid for. 
by Christ. Would you do that this morning? This morning, would you walk into that verse and say, you know what, that first all is me. I'm like a wayward sheep. I've gone astray. I've rebelled against the Lord. But by the grace of God and by faith, I'm going to walk through that verse, through the other all. He has paid my sins. All we like sheep have gone astray. By the way, did you see that? We've turned everyone to his own way. What is that? That's our self-will. That's our self-destructive lifestyle. That is us thinking we have sense enough to run our own lives. You don't. You don't. You can't fix your own problems. You can't save your own soul. You can't go to heaven on your own. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. We want what we want. And that road leads to hell. There's a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof is the way of death. Well, let me end this thing. Look what he says in verse 8. And this is the last thing. He's an appearing servant. Servant. Look what he says. He says in verse 8. He was taken from prison judgment. Who shall declare his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Uh, but, but look what he says. He says in verse 7 that he was pressed, he up, uh, afflicted, opened not his mouth, brought as lamb the slaughter, as sheep before shears is done, so he opened not his mouth. Look at this. Two times it says, and he opened not his mouth. You think that's just kind of casually thrown in there? And he opened not his mouth. Was this just coincidental that he said he opened not his mouth? Two times. Let me tell you, Jesus, the Son of God, stood before Herod. And Herod provoked, tried to provoke a response. And Jesus opened not his mouth. When Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate queried and questioned the Son of God. And Jesus opened not his mouth twice. In this one verse it says he opened not his mouth. You see it fulfilled in the New Testament. He opened not his mouth. He wasn't there to win an argument. He was there to save your soul. He wasn't there to show who was in control. He was there to allow you to go to heaven. He wasn't there trying to show he had more power than Herod or Pilate. He was there to save you. And then in verse 8 he says, in verse 8 he says, he was taken from prison and from judgment. Look at verse 9. Uh, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was deceit in his mouth. In verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Let me ask you a question. Who crucified Jesus? You read the Gospels, you might think, well, the Jews did. It was the bloodthirsty Jews that said, Give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify him. The Jews crucified the Son of God. Others might argue and say, no, I think it was the Romans. The Romans had perfected crucifixion. The Romans were the one who platted the crown on his head. The Romans were the ones that led him through the streets of Jerusalem. The Romans were the one that laid him violently down on the cross, nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. The Romans crucified the Son of God. The fact of the matter is the Romans had a, play, a role in it. The Jews had a role in it. But I want to tell you ultimately they were nothing more than pawns in the hands of an omnipotent God fulfilling His plan and His purpose. God laid on Him the iniquity of us all. God made His soul to be a sacrifice for our sins. You see, if, G if all that happened was Jesus suffered and Jesus died on a cross, there's no salvation in that. Nobody's saved because Jesus shed blood. Nobody's saved because Jesus died a violent death on the cross. We are saved today. We are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ today because when Jesus was dying on the cross, it was God. It was a righteous God, a holy God who loves us. It is God who made the soul of Jesus a sacrifice for our sins. It was God that laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was not Pilate's lamb. He was God's lamb. Amen. We're saved today. 
Not because Pilate agreed for him to be crucified. We're saved not because the Jews said crucify him. We're saved not because the Romans nailed him to a cross. We're saved because God made his own son to be sin for us. I got to quit. Let me show you one thing before I do. Look at this. Look at Isaiah 53. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Right propitiation there in your Bible. God satisfied. That's propitiation. But watch this. Therefore, will I divide him a portion with the great. Why would he divide him a portion with the great if he died and he's still dead? No, the fact that God divides Jesus a portion with the great says he didn't stay dead. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. But he didn't stay there. Who has believed our report? One glad day, I did. One day, I believed that Jesus died for my sins. One day, I believed that his death on the cross satisfied God. Who hath believed our report. You know, there are people here. They believed this report. Would you? Would you this morning believe our report that Jesus died, was buried, and he rose from the grave? Who hath believed our report? Your church, your denomination, your good works, your good intentions cannot save you. But the one who was bruised and wounded for our sins, he can save you. Don't you want to be saved today? Don't you want to know when you leave this building this morning that your sins are gone and that you belong to a loving Heavenly Father? Let's stand together. As we prepare for our invitation this morning, if the Holy Spirit of God has awakened in your heart a need for salvation, then you come to Jesus this morning. Believe on Him. Receive the free gift of salvation. He'll save you. We have His promise on it. He'll save. He'll forgive. Why don't you come this morning receiving the free gift of salvation? Will you come? Father in heaven, for some reason we feel we've only scratched the surface. But Lord, I pray enough has been shown so that sinners can find Jesus. And Lord, as we extend this invitation, may they come. Believing and receiving the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Days are filled with sorrow and